Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Matthew Minard. Uh, I am a professor of philosophy and moral theology at the Byzantine Catholic Seminary in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and also a translator of scholastic works uh, in the tradition, actually, that would have influenced John Dealey or uh, some of those who would have fallen or have, would have followed in the wake of the figures who influenced John. I'd like to begin by thanking all of the folks involved uh, with these events for the International Open Seminar on Semiotics, um, as well as the University of Coimbra for hosting, uh, centrally at least being the host of the, this event, this lecture, uh, and of course all the uh, excellent lectures that are being given over the course of really the, the next number of months. Uh, uh, we, all of us who owe a great intellectual debt to John, uh, can't uh, help but be really glad that this resource will be available now online to those we hope who can learn from our shared intellectual master. So thank you to all of you uh, who've been involved, uh, either lecturing, or putting together the events, um, and also for being here to listen to us prattle on a bit about matters semiotic. As I mentioned, I do uh, you know, part of my work uh, in digging around in the field of really in, in my case, 19th and 20th century scholasticism, uh, although I would like to do some translating and commenting work on 15, 14th and 15th century scholastic texts. I have a little dossier of these, but just haven't had the time for the obvious financial reasons, I suppose, um, for what would sell as, as a translator. But I'm gonna come here today to talk to you more about some historical points that are not going to sound at first directly semiotic, but I think they're really important for the broader semiotic community uh, to understand, just to really grasp the um, overall context in its full in its full breadth, its full measure, for um, kind of coming to bear with what John was uh, reared in in his early days as a Dominican friar, which ultimately led him to see the the importance of the works of Jean Poinceau or John of Saint Thomas. Um, and it remained with him till the end of his days. Uh, his continued involvement in the American Maritime Association really created a, a kind of parallel conceptual space for his thought where he remained quite uh, deeply in dialogue with scholastic figures within the Catholic world uh, that who or whose uh, conversations and debates clearly shape his thought in a way that could be missed if one only is involved in the more Persian line of his thought, the more semiotic line of his thought. So to understand his semiotics, we have to enter, I guess we could say, really the, over, the overall semiosis of the conceptual schema that drove the Thomism that John was an advocate of. And I, I really am a believer that the, um, the main lines of you know, John Dealey's project are Thomist in bent, but they are Thomist in a way that's quite revolutionary. And uh, in a second lecture, I'm going to try to talk about that more in detail in, a, in the conceptual register. Uh, some things that I was working on even at the end of John's life and had discussed with him. So I, I think that it's fair to say at least it's harmonious with how he would develop uh, some of the lines of Thomist metaphysics uh, to really take, um, to take stock in depth of the implications of the, the, the numerous, um, we shall say nuances that are necessary in light of the semiotic turn that is so necessary for really being able to articulate the boundaries of nature and culture and ultimately the human, the agency of the human person um, in the world, as well as the agency of, as we know, lower beings and potentially really to, to say the whole of reality as it, as it develops in its own uh, quasi historical arc uh, evolutionarily to the degree that the word arc is appropriate there. We don't want to be too much of a Whig historian of, of evolution, right? These we don't want to be overly progressive. But anyway, um, today's lecture is much more historical, and it's going to be something of a hit parade. And I hope that, though, it will give you some insight, especially those of you who are not uh, from within the, the Catholic world, some real insight into the, the structural lineaments over history of the Thomist school, uh, that's really important for understanding the, the full context of John St. Thomas's thought and hence also John Dealey's thought. So 
the title of my lecture is No Mere Flyover Country, some historical notes regarding the Scola Tome, the Thomist school, uh, as an integral context for the thought of Dr. John Dealey. So let's begin with this issue first and foremost of the terms Thomas, the thought of Thomas Aquinas and Thomism, right? Thomas Aquinas is a thinker, I should, I suppose, have a slide with his picture and his dates here, right? But he's uh, 12, circa 1225 to uh, 1274 AD in the Latin West at that very important point of 13th century scholasticism uh, where the uh, integration of the Aristotelian corpus uh, as well as certain Neoplatonic lines um, really crystallizes within uh, the Latin university environment. And uh, so you have this, this crossover moment between the older monastic period of Western Christianity and the, the coming eventually urbanization, um, but uh, also what will be the university culture of scholastic thought, which will reign in the Latin Catholic world for several centuries with real importance. Um, and then we'll have a kind of renewal at the turn of the 19th century in Latin Catholicism. The Greek world did not have a completely um, uh, analogous encounter with uh, Aristotle in a sense, because the Greek world maintained its, its own uh, organic bonds with the Aristotelian corpus. Uh, but there was also in the 1400s, 1500s, um, or yeah, 1400s in particular, I shouldn't say 1500s, but the 1400s, uh, robust interaction with um, scholastic thought in the West uh, as well. Uh, and there has been much good work done on that. There's a kind of Greek and Byzantine scholasticism in that period, but it's different because of the, the lack of the same university culture. But so you have in the 13th century, going into the 14th century in Latin Catholicism, really the beginning of a series of proliferations within Latin Catholic theology, which defines an era. It defines the terms of debate. It defines at least the broad lines of many texts until the time of the Renaissance. Among the various religious orders, but even within them, there develop separate schools of theology and ultimately to philosophy. And it's we, we have to be very comfortable with these hazy lines between theological thought and philosophical thought during this period, because so much of the good philosophy of the era of this time is done within the theological context. And so among these uh, religious orders of the day, you have the, the beginning of uh, the crystallization of certain approaches to theological and philosophical questions that then harden as these groups defend the central principles they believe uh, to be operative uh, in the writings of their chosen master. And so for this reason, you know, the most famous and hardened lines are what will come to be known as the Thomists, who are at the beginning doing some, uh, you know, ad hoc or point by point defenses of certain doctrines of Aquinas, but eventually in response to other thinkers, such as uh, the followers of John Dunn, Blessed John Dunn Scotus, the Franciscan friar in the 14th century, or who dies in the early 14th century, I should say, uh, as well as certain proto-nominalist figures, such as Durandus of St. Persan, Peter Ariel, and then eventually, yes, William of Ockham, and then others, you know, this hardens the Thomist line, but then you also have the development of schools known as the Scotist school, and a more broad, somewhat ragtag group of nominalists, those who are following some subsection of uh, the classical nominalist positions regarding ontology, common essences and things, uh, as John points out very importantly, the theory of relation, certain points of epistemology, issues as regards moral psychology. Uh, that's a, a kind of broad group who, because of the changes in their cosmology and logic come just to be known as the Via Moderna, and even their logic comes to be known, uh, terminus logic as new as the, the, the new logic or the, the modern logic. In the German world, uh, at least for a while, there is a uh, an Albertist approach to theology marked perhaps more, we might say, by the, the lines of the Neoplatonism of Pseudo Dionysius and others, although that had remained operative in Thomas Aquinas's thought, even if it was somewhat underappreciated by later uh, Thomists from time to time. And then with the at the time of the Reformation, 
there then become other schools and sub-schools within uh, the Jesuit order, which of course at, the, at Coimbra, you're going to be uh, well apprised of because of the uh the Coimbra Jesuits, but also to Gabriel Vasquez, uh, and of course, um, Suarez, uh, who was the most, still the most famous because of the amount of uh, systematization that his metaphysical writings uh, introduced into topics of metaphysics, but also too, he was a commentator on, in many ways, Aquinas uh, in his own way, uh, often splitting the difference between certain Thomist and Scotist positions. And then you have other figures like Juan de Lugo and others within the Jesuits. And then also uh, kind of within, within religious orders um, and, and joining them across boundaries, you had various debates in the later um, Reformation period over the questions of predestination, which will harden um, into lines between you know, the, the Molinists, the uh, Concordists, the Thomists of, of various levels of, of strength uh, concerning divine causality's preeminence um, in, in the causality operative within the universe. Very interesting debates over moral reasoning that, that went on for about 200 years under the, the name probabilism or the probabilist debates. And then on questions of nature and grace, you had uh, renewed uh, partisanship on behalf of certain Augustinian approaches uh, to parsing matters of uh, the psychology of conversion and the nature of conversion itself and the distinction between nature and the supernatural order, which gave birth to figures not only like Cornelius Janssen and Michael Bias, um, but also there were uh, Augustinian friars, Norris and, Ber and uh, Berti in the 18th century and then 19th century movements that are quasi uh, Augustinian, uh, maybe at least in, in their self-professed lineaments, even someone like, um, oh my goodness, um, not Roselli, Rosmini, my apologies, uh, Rosmini and others, although that's quite different because of the modern philosophy. So the point that I'm making is within the sandbox of scholasticism, you have this proliferation of schools, which will set the debate terms for how texts are to be read, and it makes them quite difficult to read, to be honest. Um, any of you who have turned even to the tr treatise on science put together by John uh, Dealey from the, uh, taken from the major logic or the material logic portion of the Cursus Philosophicus of John of St. Thomas, are well aware of how many figures there are that we do not speak of any longer, whose positions nonetheless were quite current at the time of John of St. Thomas's writing. And what you had within scholasticism is really maybe we could look at it in two ways, in a more jaundiced way, an internally concerned group of Latin Catholic authors that primarily have became convinced of the importance of their internal debates. There's a bit of that that's going on. But what you also have is a tradition of dialogue and a tradition of vocabulary, which structured the conceptual reception of the classic questions of the 13th and 14th century, uh, attempting to, to answer new questions or new issues along the way although the, the modern period is going to um, really cause a kind of disunity here, um, first of all, because of the Protestant Reformation, and then also because of the eventual secularization of the states. And so you lose the vital contact between the schools and external questions. And yet the idea of a questioning that occurs over time and not merely, you know, just at a synchronic instant is actually one of the great strengths of this scholastic approach to things, even though it also risks a kind of hyper-commentary um, sin. It really, you know, the, the temptation becomes to comment upon the commenta commentators on the original thinkers of 13th century scholasticism. So this will always be an issue in uh, Catholic thought. We're gonna feel it on and off in the context of our discussions here. And it's also one of the, the things that plagued um, John's own awareness of his place as a Thomist, because he always wanted to avoid uh, looking at his appropriation of the thought of Thomas Aquinas, but also to the Thomist school, 
he wanted to always guard against, I should say, becoming merely historically tied up with past positions, but rather to enter into the stream and to push forward and in some rather revolutionary ways, um, as we Thomists know, and as I think really in the end um, is the only way forward for a real Thomism that wants to face up to the problems of history and culture. Today, however, uh, again, our contemporary context, there's you know, a bit of a, a background squabble among Thomists about, well, what should we be focusing on? Should we be focusing on the thought of Thomas Aquinas or you know, how should we take the, the later Thomist authors? And so really there are two different kind of bents of mind among Thomists. There, was the, 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 there are those who, who are concerned primarily with what did Thomas Aquinas think himself in his context? John, John himself used to refer to this as a kind of backwards looking Thomism. Uh, and I think sometimes to the chagrin of his, his fellow uh, Thomists, wherever he was working. Uh, and then there's another approach, which is concerned with asking how was his thought received and uh, how is it deployed in the context of future debates? And so really the, the approaches that are given birth uh, from this, these twofold um, approaches to scholasticism or in particular, the thought of Thomas Aquinas and his school, really could be on the one hand, a kind of, um, well, what it came to be called uh, in French, you'll find it though occasionally in English, the Thomasian approach and the Thomist approach. A Thomasian approach uh, is not concerned with those who called themselves Thomists or how the thought of Thomas Aquinas was received, uh, but rather are concerned with a kind of initial datum. Uh, John used to say this is a very Cartesian way of looking at things. The initial datum of what is Thomas has thought himself. And usually Thomists of this bent are, are concerned with you know, medieval history, uh, you know, immediate context and sources of Thomas. Uh, and they reject Thomism as, as a kind of accretion on Thomas Aquinas's thought. Whereas the Thomist approach, as I will use it uh, here in our lecture, is to see Thomism as a vital tradition, a living tradition, uh, one that espouses certain mainline um, positions, certain main central um, points of uh, metaphysics, of theology um, that can't be abandoned, and yet uh, nonetheless allows a kind of latitude within that to then deal with the questioning of particular and on particulars and sometimes critiquing those within the fold, but always maintaining on certain topics uh, of metaphysics and uh, theology, uh, natural philosophy, of course, and all the other disciplines as well, uh, maintaining these sort of central positions. And so all sorts of things regarding the, compos the composition of finite beings, the nature of cognition, the nature of theological science as such, the subordination of the various mysteries within theology, all of these would be if we were to have a kind of catalog of the central Thomist positions, um, we could say the, the hermeneutical boundaries for then guiding the discussions within the Thomist fold. And I'm gonna walk through some of the history of this and how it, how it develops, um, but the purposes of this lecture will not be to, to sort of list that out. I have a slide where I keep that, a couple of slides I use for a different, for a class that I teach, um, but you know, I, I wanna try and stick to this history or else we're gonna already have too much content. In order to see how John articulates himself within the, the history of Thomism, I think a couple of articles are quite useful. Um, in, in There's a volume, um, oh no, this is actually um, an article, I apologize. In the Twilight of Neo-Thomism, A Call for a New Beginning, uh, Return to Philosophy, uh, in philosophy to the idea of progress by deepening insight rather than by substitution. And it's a, uh, a from a, re a lengthy review article of a book by uh, Father Benedict Ashley. And then I, another article that was of much influence on me is his uh, somewhat cheeky title, Quid Sit uh, Postmodernismus, uh, in scholastic, in like neo scholastic manual style Latin, you know, what is the essence or what is uh, postmodernism? And you get a sense here, especially for his differentiation from the much more historicist sense or historical bent of certain uh, partisans of the more medieval studies approach to Thomas Aquinas espoused by someone like um, Etienne Gilson. And then also too, there's uh, a little essay 
in the the collected volume that was put together by Paul Cobley, that excellent little white volume, um, Realism for the 21st Century, two, two essays actually, what happened to philosophy between Aquinas and Descartes and a, a prospect of post-modernity. So very, very important to understand this because John was a Thomist throughout his life till his last day. Um, and it's very important to see that, to understand some of the question space and dialogue partners that remain structural for him, even where he, even where he was not even being at all uh, explicitly even Ponsoian, if you will, where he's only interacting with the thought of purse in places. Um, so let's try and think, well, how can we periodize the perception of Thomas Aquinas's thought? Because this is no mere flyover country, it's rather the very structuring uh, narrative in the background of, of the sources drawn on by John. Um, there are two different ways, and then I'll propose a kind of marriage of them. There are multiple ways, really, but two, two that I think are, are um, the most more powerful ways to think of it. Um, and this is I'm taking from Romana Cesario has a little book. Uh, this is where this is mostly taken from. Uh, there's proposed in, I believe it's the Dictionnaire de Theologie Catholique, Reginald Garrigou Lagrange, um, considers that there's first the initial defense of St. Thomas's thought after his death from the 13th century to the 15th century. And then he, he cordons off a period that's rather brief in the early 16th century for commentators on Aquinas, which is kind of strange, uh, as we'll see, because of how uh, Thomas DeVio Cajetan is at once a defender and, and a commentator on, on Aquinas. So I'm not quite sure what to make there. And then Father Garagu has a last category that are the Tridentine reforms at onward. Um, Dom Valtz, uh, or Father Valtz, who was, uh, I believe, a, uh, a Dominican, uh, he, he and um, Oles, I forget his first name, I apologize, I should have had it written here, basically take that same scheme and then, and then split it out a little bit differently, though. And they, they propose the use of... Um, the first period basically up to John Capraeus's period sort of um, to be a kind of primitive Thomism, the first responses to the Franciscan correction literature that was published soon after the death of St. Thomas. And then the commentators would pick up from the very beginning of the 15th century um, up to the, the Tridentine period, the time of the Council of Trent um, and its closing sessions. And then up till the revolutions thereafter, and then contemporary Thomism basically being the late 1800s until today, uh, recognizing that there's there there's a little bit of open space there, especially in the 19th century. The periodization that I'll follow for our purposes is that I will I'll consider first the primitive reception of St. Thomas's thought and that how that that literature is primarily a series of responses to particular topics and to particular critiques registered against certain doctrines uh, of currency in the 13th century debates um, going on in, in Paris and Oxford, primarily at least. Uh, and then the next period I would consider to be a kind of unif a unifying and systematization uh, of Thomist thought. Um, this would be the period of commentaries and a kind of quasi canon being established. Um, and although we are simplifying this, especially as regards the, the important uh, subgroup of Bologna Thomists, um, and uh, you know, so someone even like also, um, oh, uh, not Peter, well, Bergamo, but also to uh, Silvestre de Purio, um, Christus and Giovelli and others, um, we're going to consider the canon that generally was received among uh, the Dominicans going forward into the 17th century. Um, and so this is a period of consolidation, we might say, and the real formation of the school uh, around, um, you know, a whole host of different, a whole host of different theses that now just are taken for granted um, by Thomists. And then, for lack of better terms, a sort of devolution in modernity. Uh, both the schism, the schism, the, the cut in in the breakage in. Uh, Latin Catholic thought, as well as the effect of the revolution. So the breakage that occurs because of responses to modern philosophy, as well as the uh, Reformation, as well as uh, the descholasticization that follows on the, uh, the later Renaissance. 
all of that kind of bears fruit during the post-Tridentine period and also the revolutions create a situation of significant discontinuity for scholastic thought, which really requires a robust university culture in order for it to maintain itself from generation to generation because of the level of complexity uh, of, of the um, philosophical and theological treatises of the, the later Baroque period, into the Baroque period. So, you know, I don't want to present it as being all downfall, but there's a sort of period of, as we come to be called, scholasticism in its decline or decadent scholasticism. And then finally, the immediate context of John Dewey's thought, which would be the, the Leonine renewal in the 19th century uh, into the 20th century, uh, which is still the story of Thomism today. So there were no immediate direct disciples of Thomas Aquinas. People of some, somewhat in, people who were influenced by him, yes. People who even defended him when they disagreed with him on other points. People like Godfrey of Fontaine or even Giles of Rome, even though later Dominicans also fought him on, on certain points. Um, but there was a quick response to the condemnations, which famously occurred not only, of course, in 1270 during the lifetime of St. Thomas, but also in 1277, soon after his death, at the pens of the bishops of respectively Paris and Oxford, uh, Etienne Tempier and Robert Kilwardby, actually a Dominican in Oxford uh, or Can Canterbury at this point. Now, the history of the condemnations has to be considered. Um, you know, uh, pretty closely to think of how much of Thomas was in the crosshairs, how many of the how many of the uh, condemned propositions really hit home with Thomas or Thomas's uh, own positions. There are two that are quite clear that we can say, and they were of great importance during this period, uh, namely this question of the unicity of substantial form. What is the intrinsic metaphysical unity of substance itself? And how is it that perhaps there would be a layering of substantial essences within a given being? This be was important because of certain theological questions uh, that pressed the problem concerning the corruptibility or the, you know, the, the rotting of Christ's body. How do you say that Christ's body didn't rot because of you know, what was said in the Psalms that, he, that God would not suffer his servant to know decay? Um, so before the resurrection, um, but also to uh, questions of how the Aristotelian notion of matter, especially prime matter, so the materiality as such potency um, could be or uh, should be conceived in relation to form. Uh, and it, could God create matter without form? And so, of course, for a hardline Aristotelian, one just says no, because potency is as such is determination and so pure determ or determinability and so pure determinability uh, is something that really in the end um, is nothing and so the only way that matter can even exist is as determined in other words as somehow formed uh, at the level of some some degree of substantial formality or substantial information and so the issues of Christology on the first hand with the a unicity of substantial form questions and those of divine omnipotence for the latter uh, kind of pressed uh, the thought of Thomas uh, in the eyes of certain uh, Franciscans who then began also to put together a literature of corrective texts that if the works of Thomas Aquinas were to be consulted or ever used in the Franciscan studia uh, that they had to have positions corrected, uh, 70 or 80 some positions um, that, that would need to be addressed. And so someone like uh, William de Lamar, but others as well wrote um, you know, these corrections of Brother, Tom, uh, Brother Thomas. And in response to this literature, and here's where we see how condemnations cause wars and divisions sometimes that are unnecessary. The Dominican, uh, various Dominicans at the bequest of the order who felt themselves to have the wind behind their sails because the Roman Curia at least broadly supported them. Uh, these Dominican figures wrote their own, we could say, corrections of these corrections, or they also would refer to the, um, these correctives as kinds of corruptions of Thomas's thought. And so we find not 
solely, but during this uh, period, these defenses above all about the unicity of substantial form, the fact that uh, form and matter must be together, that matter cannot be uninformed. Some discussions also about the, the question, which is of course quite famous from the 20th century of the distinction between essence and existence. Um, and so, uh, I mean, these are sort of at the level of what treatises would at least uh, handle at length, um, as well as addressing the other corrections that were offered by the Franciscans. And so figures whom we don't read much uh, today, although uh, they are the immediate context for the, the formation of a Dominican phalanx, uh, phalanx uh, Dominican defense maneuver, uh, Richard Knapwell, like, likely the Dominican Robert of Orford, Jean Kidor, um in Paris, who took some positions that later were critiqued by Thomists, but perhaps William of Macclesfield, an English Dominican um, a, uh, and a uh, Italian, uh, Rembrandt of Primadisi. I apologize to my Italians uh, for my non-existent use of the Italian language. Uh, they all wrote uh, corrections to the corrections of the Franciscans or uh, claims that the corrections were corruptions. Um, and you can find an account of this from, in a very orderly fashion in uh, John Terrell's, Jean-Pierre Terrell's um, biography of Aquinas, which has, uh, if you wait till the third edition, even updated um, bibliographical information on the state of research regarding these works. Uh, so maybe wait around for that. But so what you have here is a, a kind of ad hoc defense of, of certain positions uh, during this period, not a full development of um, even a commentary style on Aquinas' thought, or at least um, a detailed account of how his thought developed. Early on, I don't make much of my slides about this, but early on, the, the Dominicans did sense the fact that there had been a diachronic development in Thomas's thought. And so you have uh, a literature of, you know, Melius Dixit, where he better said something, where he put it better. Um, but, you know, this literature would be uh, perhaps more concerned from what I, I understand of it, at least, um, with that idea of Melius Dixit. He said it better, but not that he changed his mind totally, um, you know, then claiming that he, Thomas had changed his mind. What's also going to be noticed here as well is that really the, uh, the use of his commentary on Peter Lombard's sentences will remain at least formative, uh, not, not sole though, um, for, for the period because the, the sentences was still used as the primary teaching text in the medieval universities at the time. But we'll remark a little bit more on some of that whenever we come to um, the, the work of uh, John Capralis. So still during this period of um, primitive Thomism, um, a defense of uh, Richard Knapwell, who's actually a kind of tragic figure um, uh, by William of Hotham, and that's in the vein of the substantial form debates. Um, Thomas Sutton is known, uh, we could say has the glory of being the first to really directly address uh, John Duns Scotus, although actually Hervéus Natalis as well in the 14th century, um, the master of the, the order at the time of just before his canonization, um, also penned defenses and actually incorporated certain things from uh, John Duns Scotus as well. Hervéus Natalis has a very interesting treatise on second intentions uh, that actually John's work put me on to, uh, and that's what I did my dissertation work on. And he pens as well a, an explicit defense of, of Thomas's thought. Um, and so you're starting to get this idea of trying to, to defend more whole cloth Thomas's thought, but he imports in his sentences commentary, uh, various SCOTUS positions in uh, just, for example, the divine names, but also his cognition, his cognitional theory is marked by SCOTUS precisions regarding objectivity and the nature of um, intentionality as well. Um, but so, uh, as I mentioned, in someone like Thomas Claxton in the 15th century, a little bit later, uh, the discussion of essence and existence, which had split, began splitting the scholastic schools, is taken up for its own right uh, as well. 
And uh, if you were to take a look at Cesario's little book on the history of Thomism, it's a brief history of Thomism, you can find information on the German Thomists and Albertists um, of the uh, 15th, 15th century, or sorry, 14th century. Uh, and also to the, the reception of certain moral texts in Italy uh, by uh, certain moral texts of Thomas. This was another thing during this period, which I don't think I have quite clearly on these slides, but it's important to bear in mind as well as a background for thinking of how Aquinas is appropriated, right? There, there's a good sense historically to say that the 14th century is actually a Franciscan century in, in the uh, reigning, we would say most influential schools, both the the disciples of John Duns Scotus who are looking to systematize his thought as well as the, the various uh, streams that, that then run in relation to the nominalism of the 14th century. And Thomas has thought as a whole, since it's not taken up uh, really until the time of uh, Caprailus, uh, you know, it's going to be used uh, by those who see its uh, fruitfulness for pastoral applications. And so, uh, for instance, whenever Thomas's moral thought is received, you end up having a, a series of texts that are um, digests of sections of his Prima Secundae and his also Secunda Secundae, the second part of the moral part of the Summa Theologiae, uh, that become a kind of uh, digest for confessors that is uh, of use. And it's, you know, in a way, the, the channel by which Thomas's work becomes more broadly known, because it's, it's not merely then received as merely an academic enterprise, but it also represents something of a, of a distortion of the very project of the Summa Theologiae, which sought to actually marry together dogma and morality together tightly. Um, and this, this is, you know, eventually going to, by the time of the Reformation, in, in Catholic and Reformed thought, lead to the, the distinction within theology between dogmatic theology and moral theology, which is and spiritual theology actually as well, which is quite um, foreign to the, the high middle age period. But that's not really you know, of over importance for the background of John's thought. Um, so let's keep going because we're gonna get into the move toward the systematization period, which is really the most centrally important section other than maybe some of the immediate predecessors to John as well to keep in mind. You know, so the 14th century, in addition to being in a sense, the Franciscan century um, is, is also too marked by all the discontinuities of the great Western schism within the Latin church, um, the, the issues of the bubonic plague, um, the various movements that come to be deemed heretical by church authorities. Um, you know, I mean, just the plague itself causes the loss of I think right about a quarter of population of Western Europe. Um, this has immense social ramifications, um, you know, and then it has immense ramifications on, on the university as well. But with the half century and then a little bit more, you know, going on a century really of century uh, since Thomas's passing, you finally have within the Dominicans um, this moment of crystallization forsaged a bit in, in the 14th century and someone like William Peter Godinus uh, or Godin, um, who writes on the sentences of Peter Lombard, um, a reading of, of Thomas's thought in view of the structure of Lombard sentences. As I'm sure almost all of you know, Peter Lombard's sentences, of course, were uh, this important um, th this important hyper commentary text uh, from the taking over from the 12th century uh, Western theological debates, a structure of theology in four books treating issues of uh, dogmatic theology the in both the sacraments and the theology of God, Trinitarian theology and Christology, as well as um, moral questions as well. Um, the uh, occur, the curses of you know so treatment of God, treatment of providence, and the treatment of morals, and the treatment of the sacraments um, that gave the backbone for the academic um, 
you know, the, the, uh, the academic formation and the, the first academic writing, you know, as I tell them, my undergraduates, their dissertation writing, but the first great commentary that would have to be written in order to, to be a fully licensed master of theology. And so uh, the, this, this goes on as a structural text, you know, most influentially into, into the 16th century, although some, somewhat into the 18th century in certain, certain circles from what I understand. But let's just say until the 16th century, the, the structural text for learning how to comment on the topics of theology, but you're not merely commenting on Peter Lombard, you are commenting on the topics that have been discussed and debated in the schools on the questions raised within the context of Lombard sentences. If I might for a moment here stick a pin in, this is a good example, and I think it's actually quite important for unique research in semiotics. The fourth book of Peter Lombard's sentences on the sacraments is really the place to find the semiotics of the medieval men. Uh, and eventually changes within the theological curriculum and debates are going to lessen the treatment of this book because so many other issues get bogged down even by the time you get to William of Ockham in the, uh, you know, within the late first quarter of the thir uh, 1300s. The things that get so bogged down in the first and second book of the sentences, you don't even get to the fourth in detail, but the fourth book is where the discussion of the doctrine of signs and the sacraments is taken up. And this is really, I think, a powerful place, and we'll see in Poinceau, I think an important place as well, for uh, understanding the nature of practical signs moral and technical and artistic signs uh, in the semiosis of culture. Uh, John is quite well aware of this phenomenon, but I sometimes think that he systematically never treated it. I, mean, I know he didn't treat it, and he, he didn't have quite an answer for me about that at the end of his life. Um, uh, I think it's partially just because that stuff was so limited in its uh, exposure in the later literature in scholastics. Uh, but Maritan saw it, and we'll come back to that, actually. But anyway, Lombard's fourth book, uh, that's what I wanted to make the point about. But since that text was used as the primary teaching text, even, even where some of the more major works of St. Thomas Aquinas, be it his Summa Contra Gentiles, his Summa Theologiae, or his later um, texts on, uh, or his later disputed questions, uh, or sections of his biblical commentaries or his commentaries on Aristotle were used or consulted. Nonetheless, if you're sitting down and doing your commentary on, uh, you know, on the sentences, it's going to be easiest to refer back to what Thomas is using in the, in his sentences commentary, right? Like you, you would start with, the, if, if you're doing distinction 12 of the first book of the sentences, you'd look at distinction 12 of Thomas's commentary on the sentences, which would be his, his earliest treatment of the topic. Well, John Caprailus, a Dominican in the 14th and then into the 15th century, um, the French, uh, French Dominican, uh, pens over a course of uh, over 20 years, a commentary uh, in defense of the positions of Thomas theologically on top of the, the sentences. So within the context of Peter Lombard's particular layout of the theological questions in the four books of the sentences, he then rallies in response to the various figures, Peter Ariel, John Duns Scotus, uh, and some of Scotus's um, you know, systematizers after his, his early death. Um, Gregory, of, I think Gregory of Rimini folk comes up enough, uh, significantly enough, William of Ockham and the later, later nominalists. Um, and then other figures too, but I mean, really it's the, the Scotus, the nominalist, Ariel, these are the, the big response, people to be responded to. Uh, Capralis begins to, to systematize the, the way of approaching the text that will then answer the objections of particular schools, which had been, been crystallizing through the course of the 14th century. And here we have the sense now of a Thomas school that is beginning to become, will, will begin to become um, self-aware because of the influence of um, Capralis's work. It says here, princes, it should be the princeps 
Tomistarum. He becomes known as the prince of the Thomists uh, for this work. And his work will be consulted theologically um, you know, all the way through, uh, even, af even after the period of Thomas DeVio Cajetan's changes to the curriculum, but he'll be influential all the way up through the great period of the early commentators. Um, and I've got a couple of, I apologize, I've got a couple of uh, errors on this um, slide. So I'll have to fix that for my next time I ever use this. But on the top of the sentences, now we have a response drawing somewhat from the full corpus of Aquinas too, uh, to, to how on all the various topics of human cognition, knowledge of God, the nature of the Trinity, uh, how to understand creation, how to talk about matters moral, how to discuss matters of, of the sacramental order, a response to, to the other schools uh, of thought in that period. And hence you have ready at hand now a budding uh, tradition of trying to figure out what are the central theses of Thomas's thought regarding cognition, regarding the Trinity, regarding nature and grace, regarding um, you know, sacramental causality, Christology, et cetera. And all of these have important ramifications philosophically for the school that really need to be understood. Uh, one of the things John always did was he, he kind of put a big wall between the theological stuff in his mind and the philosophical content. Um, and I, I think that the contemporary university is going to, of course, encourage that, but you really can't understand these thinkers unless you at least dialectically take seriously the theological context for the, the, the philosophical work that they're doing. Um, there were unfortunate losses um, ultimately in this period as well. Um, the hardening lines between East and West, um, you know, especially with the fall of Constantinople in the mid 15th century, um, you know, brought an end to Byzantine Thomism. Although the, although the Cadonis brothers um, maybe famously or infamously are the best known um, also, too, there is someone like the Patriarch of Constantinople, Gennadio Scalarios, the last Patriarch before the, the fall to the Ottomans, um, who was deeply um, involved in, in reading Thomas Aquinas's work, deeply enamored of it, uh, and yet also himself remains a, a kind of Palamite uh, in defense of St. Gregory Palamas in the Byzantine East, um, and, uh, you know, recognizes differences between his position as an Orthodox and certain things in, in Aquinas, very minor uh, in the end. But he, he lamented that Thomas was not born among the Greeks because he, he was a Greek in mind, uh, which is not untrue given uh, Thomas's debted, indebtedness, not only of course to uh, Aristotle, but to Pseudo Dionysius, who is of course deeply indebted to Proclus. Uh, and then also, too, in his theological work, the seriousness with which he read the Eastern Church Fathers. And there's interesting stuff here uh, that wasn't of much influence, though, on John, but I have it on a, a slide that this is, this is um, developed out of. Uh, you might be interested, though, in reading the works of Marcus Plested, Christian Kappus, John Dimitrakopoulos. Um, all of them are, are doing work that's quite interesting in this world. Um, but then... The rest of the commentary tradition uh, also develops during this 15th and 16th century period. And so not only does the sentences get its own commentary, but eventually the Summa Theologiae, or the Summa Theologica, as some people call it, um, comes to be commented on in its, in its entirety. Uh, you can see in Cesario's little work, um, some of the various German and Nordic figure, figures who are important during this period. A particular note, though, is uh, Conrad Kuhlen uh, in the 16th century, who pens a partial commentary on, um, on the Summa Theologiae. There's Dennis the Carthusian, or Dion uh, Dionysus, Dionysius uh, the Carthusian in the fifteenth mid-15th century. It's a huge oeuvre of works. Um, who, who um, I mean, he's, he's living in a different religious order, um, but is a very important source for finding out later um, scholastic debates. Tim Noon has always emphasized the importance of Dennis the Carthusian uh, as a source for late medievalists, um, but also to Dominic of Flanders, who uh, 
penned a metaphysics commentary, which is somewhat unique because Thomas Aquinas, you know, for instance, has has no metaphysical disputations in the way that John Duns Scotus did early in his career, and as Suarez will later on. But what grows during this period, and I think it's more important for our purposes, because it's going to basically structure everything after John of St. from well from Cajetan onward, but John of St. Thomas onward in particular among the Dominicans, is the, the growing focus on the Summa Theologiae, is the structural text for laying out St. Thomas Aquinas' thought. Um, Peter of Bergamo is going to put together the Tabula Aria, which is, of course, a full, is, attempts to be a full um, uh, index of Thomas's works. But all, it, it, ultimately, during this period, the Summa Theologiae is, is given preeminence, eventually, as the text for understanding Aquinas's um, mature thought. And although certain, on certain topics, he has later um, texts that chronologically come after his treatment, for instance, in, of things like the Prima Pars, uh, the Summa Theologiae is the last work worked on over the course of over a decade by Thomas. And so it is more mature than the um, sentences commentary from the very beginning of his academic career. Uh, also, too, of course, this period is marked, though, with that animosity between scholastics and humanists, which will come to be exacerbated, exacerbated by the Reformation. Um, but we're more interested in really the, the Thomists who left the biggest stamp on the later Thomist school and the Dominican curriculum. And so even though someone like Peter of Bergamo and uh, Silvestro uh, de Prairie, uh, Prairio, or Prairius, as he's known, or also, um, oh, Chrysostom Giovelli uh, would be influential in their time. The ones who remain with the biggest stamp are John Capralis, Thomas de Vio Cajetan, uh, from the, or Cajetan as he's known, but in English we most often just call him Cajetan, uh, 15th to 16th century, dying in 1534. And also to Francesco uh, uh, Silvestri, also known as Silvestro Ferrara. And maybe because of the, the way I'm structuring my narrative, I'll just comment briefly there. He wrote uh, in the 16th century a commentary on the Summa Contra Gentiles, and at times differing, for instance, from Cajetan on certain positions, especially regarding analogy, the analogy of being and the semiotics involved with that. I guess that's a little bit anachronistic to say, to say. but the, the process of analogy he disagrees with Cajetan on, um, as well as certain questions of nature and grace. But that commentary on the Summa Contra Gentiles will become bequeathed to the, uh, the Leonine period of scholasticism by being published with alongside the Summa Contra Gentiles. So Silvestro, Silvestro Ferrara's commentary um, kind of goes forward in the, the period of, of the, the Leonine reforms. And it's, it's uh, referred to by later Thomists as well. Cajetan's commentary, though, on the Summa Theologiae, along with the uh, updating of the curriculum of the Dominicans of that time to give a central place finally to the Summa Theologiae, will stamp the structure of the later philosophical, or I apologize, the later theological curses. And here it's important to understand <clears throat> for when you consult um, John, uh, John of St. Thomas or John Poinceau, the the way that the Summa Theologiae is laid out. So it's not emphasized enough um, because there's a certain reading of the, the Summa Theologiae of Aquinas that focuses on uh, this line from the beginning, very Neoplatonic idea of how all things go forth from God and come back to him uh, by, by means of Christ, who is the way by which they return. Um, so this exitus reditus schema. Uh, and it was much was made of it by uh, Marie Dominique Chenu, for instance, in the 20th century. And it's not incorrect, but the structure of the Summa Theologiae is very much along the lines of what uh, uh, Aristotle lays out in the posterior analytics for a science. What must a scientific discipline look like asking certain questions about its subject and that which is related to its subject in a way that is per se or essential? Um, and it's therefore broken up into a series of treatises, uh, beginning with its central subject, the triune God, and then moving down through God, uh, God considered as creator or creation as the effect of God and how providence is involved uh, in, in the act of creation. And then the moral questions, uh, which deal with 
um, you know, basically how the human person is integrated into the life of the Trinity uh, and how are we to understand that beatitude and human acts as principles of intrinsic principles of human agency and what are the extrinsic principles of human agency so there are treatises on grace and treatise well treatise on law treatise on grace passions and, and whatnot before that and then there's the various virtues are considered and then there there is the treatment of christology uh because we now have in place our our full treatment of questions of God and the questions of morality. I mean, this is this is in a way very heady because he descends downward in a very almost geometric fashion uh, from the central truths to those which then are, we could say, conceptually derivative. Now, the problem, there are theological critiques that could be made to this method because it's, it's so speculative or so um, deductive that it places Christology at the end. And so, I mean, there, there are real uh, theological questions to be raised here, but what's important for our purposes, because we're not worried about that theological issue, is to note the way that these treatises are laid out because then all the later commentaries in the Thomas School, or the, they're not commentaries so much as they are curses, uh, you know, courses of theology, will be concerned with thinking about uh, things in terms of these treatises. Um, so you'll treat the, tri the triune God, creation, providence, you know, beatitude, human acts, da, 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 Christ, the Savior, the sacraments, etc. Um, and so, if that's the overall structure of the Summa Theologiae, um, there's there's you know an important place to be given to him who commented on Thomas um, in the direct context of the Summa Theologiae, and that's Thomas DeVio Cajetan. Um, he, uh, his primary, he's of course, he's known for his, his role with Martin Luther um, and his place within the, the Dominican order's uh, leadership structure, but his commentary is in, in many ways a close textual read of Thomas written in response to primarily Scotist objections. Uh, Cajetan's foes are always the Scotists against whom he taught in his youth, in his mind. And so you have a sense of the reception of the Scotist school of his period, always in the background of his mind where he's trying to do a close textual analysis of each of the articles of Aquinas, uh, but he sometimes inflects things within a Scotist context. And you have a sense at times of Scotist vocabulary that creeps into his thought for my part, I'm not against that. I think that that's just the nature of what dialogue is like and as vocabularies develop. But certain Thomasian purists uh, look askance at that. But the commentary uh, on the Summa Theologiae becomes a touch point because it's a complete commentary um, for later uh, the later Thomists after this. And then whenever you start to have the crystallization of Iberian scholasticism in figures like Francisco de Vitoria, uh, Domingo de Soto, Domin uh, Domingo Banez, um, and then the Jesuits of that period as well, uh, you will have the structuring of um, commentaries being based on parts of the Summa Theologiae. Uh, and then that will structure the theological curses of John of St. Thomas. Of course, this period of the Reformation gives birth then to a new school or new set of schools among the Jesuits. Most famously, yes, Francisco Suarez or Suarez um, in the 15th to early, I'm sorry, the 16th to early 17th century, but also, of course, famously as well, uh, Luis de Molina, uh, who is going to be uh, influential in the debates, who's thought will be influential in the debates uh, over the divine aids de auxiliis on providence, um, Juan de Lugo and others. And there are Franciscan figures as well within the Scotist, um, broadly Scotist tradition too. The, the important figures, you know, before John of St. Thomas are going to in particular be, uh, for, well, of course, Cajetan, um, and then uh, Domingo de Soto, Domingo Banez, um, and Francisco de Vitoria. A little bit less so, but De Soto, of course, quite as a teacher. Um, and so uh, 
we bring ourselves, therefore, to John of St. Thomas's thought. And here, I think it's important for all of you just to pause for a moment to, to get a sense for the overall texts. Because what a lot of you have been exposed to, no doubt, has been the subsection of texts from the material logic that John took the um, semiotic, uh, the treatise to sign, the treatise on signs from. Uh, but really, the the whole cursus philosophicus is it really you know made up of both logical topics and questions of natural philosophy in the uh, Aristotelian sense of that term. The cursus philosophicus nowadays in the riser edition spans three three volumes. Uh, the first volume is dedicated to questions of um, formal and material logic, quite detailed and quite lengthy. Some of that has been translated and some not. Um, the formal logic questions have not been translated, just the introductory portion. And the material logic, which is going to be devoted to certain things out of the post predicaments of the uh, categories, and then also the, well, bits of the on interpretation, because you have that in the the questions devoted to um, uh, the, the sem semiotics questions. And it's not just the post predicaments either, it's most of the categories because there, there's a discussion of the various categories of material logic. And then the posture analytics as the preeminent application of reasoning to its particular matter that is certain, which is scientific reasoning in the Aristotelian understanding thereof. So those are the sort of questions taken up in the material logic. And that's where the material logic is where the treatise on signs content primarily comes from, where John of St. Thomas treat, turns to a material logic con consideration of, um, so not merely the formal validity or the formal structure of opposition that one would do as regards the um, De Interpretatione, um, but there is concerned with questions of, you know, uh, the, na the nature of signs as such. And that's what John draws most of his material from. But as John himself noted, the other places of importance for semiotics in John of St. Thomas's thought in his philosophical texts are his treatment of knowledge as well, animated being, if you will. So the treatment of the, the soul and uh, the, the elaboration of knowledge that happens in terms of what the Aristotelians call the internal senses, so our capacities for especially memory and active imagination, the latter comes to be called in the human case, the cogitative power, uh, but then also to intellection uh, or human specific, species specific semiosis, um, our specific uh, manner of cognition. And so there are, there are things that are important as well regarding the um, philosophical psychological presuppositions of semiotics that are completely inform John's thought. As anyone knows who, who has read his works, uh, this treatment of cognition, which is quite technical, is really important for him. I mean, you find it all throughout his works, but of course, you know, it's going to come straight roaring to the fore in a work like um, Intentionality and Semiotics. But I assure you, it's just all throughout. And so I really implore those of you who are interested to, to take time to digest this, this content, which is a bit difficult to do if you're not in the scholastic, you know, um, in the ditches doing scholastic work. Um, so, you know, the, some of the things to mediate this, in addition to Jacques Maritain, uh, his uh, degrees of knowledge, and Yves Simone's Metaphysics of Cognition, or Ontology of Cognition, whatever it's called, I have it up here, uh, it, Metaphysics of Knowledge, Introduction to Metaphysics of Knowledge, which is very good. If you've not read Yves Simone's Introduction to Metaphysics of Knowledge, you should read it, because even where he may differ on this or that from John, it will introduce it to you. As well as Pfeiffer has a little book called The Mystery of Knowledge or The Concept in Thomism. Those will give you a good background, especially that last one by Pfeiffer, a uh, good background of the, the content here in the later Thomas school. But you can also find then in the scholastic manuals, the ones that are going to be most influenced by John of St. Thomas will be Joseph Gret, the uh, Benedictine who, who taught at the uh, San Anselmo, I believe he was at San Anselmo in Rome. His uh, Elementa Philosophiae Aristotelico Thomistice um, is 
is uh, a digest of um, a John of St. Thomas's thought, except for the metaphysics stuff, because then it's going to be a little bit stuff added on. There's no metaphysics section to John of St. Thomas. Um, these, so many of the, the Dominicans, with the exception, um, oh, now the name has, has slipped from my mind, with the exception of, I'm going to see it now and be angry at myself for forgetting, Dominic of Flanders. With the exception of Dominic of Flanders, no one's really writing uh, full metaphysical treatises. Um, at least it's not a genre for the Dominicans. So that stuff is going to be faithfully in line with some of the later Thomists, but that's more off of Gred's pen. But Gred is very much doing a digest of John of St. Thomas. Um, and then also to uh, Francois Xavier uh, Macart, um, his element of philosophie very much is in line with not only John of St. Thomas, but also Maritain and Reginald Garrigou Lagrange's uh, reception of the Thomist school. And that actually influenced John quite a bit as well. And so that's a useful manual to look at if your Latin is decent. And then something, I, I have a separate slide on him, uh, somewhat unknown figure who should be at least more well-known in my opinion for his pedagogy is uh, Austin Woodbury, his notes, uh, which are, are really, to be honest, the most technical and yet clear, albeit tediously dry at times, uh, layout of the Thomist school. If you wanna understand the Thomist school's background of John's thought, probably, de, uh, probably Woodbury's notes are the, the clearest place to go. And they have connections to, to John's estate actually. So I'll comment on that in a bit. Critical edition of the Cursus Philosophicus is, is the riser edition, which was, I can't remember if it was Georg Olms uh, or if it was another press, but someone, uh, it was republished at John's request. Um, so you can still get a contemporary edition that's on better paper than the old one. The others on, got acid in it. Um, so I have a set of the, the old, old ones, which are quite yellowed. Um, but the other text to be consulted, I mean, and you could do this really for a number of different topics, but I'm gonna just hammer home on one is the, the Cursus Theologicus. John does on occasion, of course, read uh, Poinceau's Cursus Theologicus, but the one place that's so important for developing his semiotic thought is to visit his treatise on the sacraments, which is probably, from what I understand, a reportatio at best. It's a it's a based on his lectures. Um, it's not directly from his pen and edited. It's the last volume of the non-critical edition. And nonetheless, some of the discussion there of practic practical signification um, is the only place you're going to find it at that length and depth um, because it, it gets kind of lost, this idea of the sacraments of the church as signs. Um, the later Thomists know that they have to hold that position, and yet there's a fear of Protestantism that, that downplays that. And this is a very important thing. Uh, for, for understanding the very essay that started John's real love of the topic of, of uh, semiotics, that, that essay by Maritain on, called Sign and Symbol, which can be found in the volume Redeeming the Time, Redeeming the Times, uh, is uh, at the end is devoted to, I mean, in some length, the questions of practical signification. Um, and I, you know, I've been gathering notes on this topic, but it's very important for then getting out of a kind of rut where we talk about signs in a language that's only or primarily that of the material logic, speculative signs in the, the, the um, Aristotelian verbiage. Practical signs are all around us, right? I mean, that's the domain of there are signs everywhere around us. A book itself is a practical sign of the idea to read. It signals to me the, the practical, um, what do you call it? The, the um, practice that we have as a culture of picking these sorts of things up, opening them and reading letters. Um, my goodness, letters themselves have become signs of the activity of interpreting um, glyphs to be words, cups, are signs of the activity of drinking. It's cold coffee. Um, 
pencils are signs of the activity of writing. All sorts of things, you know, all sorts of things. I guess you could say the clothes like this are a sign that I act as professor all around all around uh, in the order of both moral and artistic agency. And it's treated in the, the ninth volume, I believe it is ninth, yes, the ninth volume of the Cursus Theologicus. Very important, and I really want to encourage the semiotics community to consider this. But if you're interested in an introduction to the text, there's a, a translation of the Isagogi, uh, Isagoge, I should say, which is the, um, you know, the introduction to the Summa Theologiae written by uh, John of St. Thomas that's in, in translation in English by Ralph McInerney. So the semiotician will be most interested in the stuff that's in the Tractatus de Signes that's put together by John, uh, John Dealey, of course, from the, the stuff in the material logic primarily, texts on cognition in the De Anima, natural philosophy stuff in the Cursus Philosophicus and the sacraments texts. Okay. Well, I gotta, we gotta move pretty quickly. So to, we can do this, I think, relatively quickly though. And I can just skip over some of the names, but they're here if you're interested. Um, there's then the, the continued systematization and then the partial devolution of Thomism in the modern era, which will then be this sort of backdrop for the Leonine um, development or the Leonine renewal of Thomism that occurs in the 19th and 20th century, which structured the reception of Thomas that John experienced as a young man. You have still in the 17th into the early 18th century um, in the Salamanca Carmelites, uh, the Salmonticenses as they come to be known, um, you know, a robust commentary tradition that over the course of a number of decades works through the treatises of theology and, and um, you know, debates in light of contemporary, especially contemporary theological debates, um, the, you know, the various questions uh, bequeathed on grace and on predestination, on the sacraments, on our knowledge of God and so forth. And although there's, there is, of course, the philosophical backbone to this, there is this was received by later Dominicans, mostly in terms of the theological debates um, that, that they address. But, you know, a great deal of erudition in the midst of the schools you'll find in the, the many volumes of the Salmonticenses. Um, a rather clean account of the school at this time, though, is Jean-Baptiste Gonnet in the 17th century. So if you ever want to like, have a clean account of John of St. Thomas, there's Jean-Baptiste Gonnet, and there's also Charles-René Billuard. Uh, in the 18th century, that you can get a generally faithful account of what John of St. Thomas's position would be in a shorter form um, in a work known as the Summa Sancti uh, Tome, um, which is heavily based actually on Vincenzo Ludovico Gotti's work. Um, but still, it became after the, even after the, the experience of the French Revolution, it was the, the text of choice for. Um, uh, reading or teaching Thomas's thought. So there's a, a lot of bizarre in the background of 19th century Thomism. Um, but also too, it, you can start to feel in comparison with John of St. Thomas, a kind of slippage, but it's useful, even if it's not as profound, to consult um, Antoine Godin's uh, philosophical texts, which in which you find some explicit interaction with modern philosophy as well, Cartesian stuff, as well as some of the sensism of, of classical early empiricism uh, as well. So the, the debates of the era though at this time, in many ways side, start to sideline the, the uh, systematic outlook. And so, you know, the issues of probabilism concerning uh, uh, moral knowledge and surety, become rather uh, all consuming for several centuries in the Roman Catholic world, uh, as do the famous predestination questions uh, leading up to the Congregatio de Auxiliis um, as well between the Jesuits and the Dominicans. And then politically, so in addition to the loss of systematic, um, systematic uh, major systematic texts that are pushing forward instead of being merely defensive of the school, you have then the political dis, uh, dis uh, equilibrium, loss of equilibrium, sorry, uh, disequilibrization, the, the problems that come from the French Revolution, 
the 18, uh, 1848 revolutions and so forth, uh, you know, really upended already what was beginning to be upended because of the splits from Protestantism, the, the scholastic culture, um, you know, the continuity that was necessary for this kind of scholastic debate, probably for good and ill. I mean, it's, it, there are many ills that were caused by this, um, but, you know, uh, maybe it, it teaches a lesson as well to those of us who look back as Catholics, not to always fall into this internal squabbling as well. But it was a great loss too, because there's an immense amount of technical erudition. Um, there's a text that was, oh, just re released recently about the probabilism stuff um, on the debate on prob probable opinions uh, by uh, Schusler, Rudolf Schusler, uh, that, that really says there's much to be learned by contemporary action theory just by looking back to the probabilist debates among the scholastics, because there was such technical detail there. But okay, quick as a quick like a bunny, we need to get over the rest of this content. To understand really what's going on in 19th century Thomism, it's within the context or what its effects eventually are. It's within the context of then what becomes a series of papal actions within the Roman Catholic Church to encourage the consultation of the works of Thomas and then also other scholastic figures, but it becomes very much a Thomist movement, to be honest. Um, after Leo XIII, um, the Pope in the, the latter part for long papacy, actually, in the 19th century, in his encyclical Eterni Patris on Christian philosophy, but also to his encyclical Rerum Novarum about new things, uh, in this case, in the social doctrine world, uh, he bears witness to the Jesuits who influenced him, uh, like Luigi Tapparelli and others, um, concerning social matters uh, as well, political philosophy, we might say. And so then there are a number of other things in the early 20th century that mark this period as well, especially, most importantly, the modernist crisis, actually, in the Catholic world. But 19th century scholasticism and 19th century Thomism really becomes a set of responses to the epistemological issues at hand after uh, the Kantian revolutions, the Kantian Copernican revolutions, if you will, as well as the uh, uh, political questions that arise because of the distinction uh, and differentiation of the civil state from direct ecclesiastical or at least quite strong indirect ecclesiastical influence. And so during this period, um, you know, questions of po politics and questions of epistemology become very important. That structures the background of a lot of John's training, that epistemology stuff in particular. Neo-Thomism and neo-scholasticism becomes almost obsessed with epistemological questions. Um, and that's in a sense what one has to get beyond. Uh, and John was well aware of that. Um, but a number of Jesuit figures uh, really um, you know, were operative in circles that eventually um, influenced Leo the Thirteenth, and so you know one should bear in mind uh, this fact. It's good if you read the McCool volume on nineteenth-century scholasticism to see. Um, I mean, in particular, Taparelli, Liberatore, um, several others as well, whose names escape me right now. At Vatican One, Joseph Kulichin. Um, of course, there is there is also little bit mixed. He's not not totally a scholastic, although he's not unaware of it all. Uh, someone like, um, oh, his name came to me and then went away. Oh, uh, Johannes Baptist uh, Franzelin, and also the autodidact um, of sorts. Um, Matthias Schieben is interesting during this period as well as kind of crossover figure between uh, resource malt thinkers and the scholastics. Um, one of the influential Dominicans on uh, on the thought of later on Leo the Thirteenth is uh, Tommaso Maria Zigliara, um, but you can get all of this in McCool's thought, McCool's history on nineteenth century scholasticism. That's the second century, the second edition name, and this leads up to then kind of the the mainline Roman Catholic outlook being to go back to Thomas Aquinas and recover him. And you know that that injects into this period then this to go back to the beginning of our talk the bifurcation 
of at once trying to go back to the historical Thomas, but also using him to address modern problems in, you know, especially epistemology and politics at first, um, although that then increasingly develops to other topics later on in the 20th century. And so you have both that Thomist and Thomasian line that is kind of throughout the thinkers of the Leonine uh, era that would have influenced John's own thought. Not everyone is a neo-scholastic, therefore the same way, or a neo-Thomist, especially the Dominicans are the least likely to be neo-Thomist, even if they are caught up in neo-scholastic questions. The Dominicans kept, it, on the whole, even if it was just tenuously through someone like Beliuar, um, a connection to their school. And so some of the, the um, thinkers who are going to be most influential on the background of the Dominicans who are teaching John would be those who are, are if not exactly him, uh, in line with someone like Reginald Garrigou Lagrange. Uh, and I'm not special pleading for my own work because I've done a good bit of, good bit of translating of his, his texts. Garrigou Lagrange was of influence on uh, many, to many Dominicans of the first half of the 20th century, and also was very influential on Jacques Maritain uh, and Yves Simone, but Maritain in particular was very close to him. Uh, and, and therefore both directly and indirectly was of great influence on the reception of Thomas's thought uh, for John. There are others, there, there are those who were operative at the House of Studies known as the Salchoir, most especially in relation to Garrigou, who, who would be, I think, an important point of contact, is Ambrose Gardet, uh, kind of uh, both interested in uh, questions of theological methodology, so tied up in some of those modernist controversy questions, uh, and also spiritual theology later in his life. But then a number of, interestingly, those historical Thomas, the Thomasian line that I mentioned. So uh, people like, especially Pierre Mandonet, Chenou, Yves-Marie Congar, uh, Jérôme Hamer, Hamer uh, will be uh, in that more historical Thomas line, especially someone like Chenou. Uh, Congar is a mixture. Congar didn't like Baroque scholasticism, but wanted to answer new questions. He wasn't merely kind of the historical Thomist in the way Chenou was. Chenou was also two different people. He was at once an activist and, and a medievalist. Um, there were the Roman Thomists, which is where Garrigou is usually slotted, uh, but you actually have there, you know, you have both the Jesuits like Louis Biot, who's not totally a Thomist on many things, but still opted for Thomas over Suarez in an, in an important uh, set of dis disagreements within the Jesuit world, and also Charles Boyer. Um, and then you had the Dominicans, who very much would be of influence on the background of the reception of Aquinas, that um, John Dealey would have received. Uh, someone like Edward Hugon, but even there it's gonna be more theological probably, even though he does have a series of philosophical texts that will give you an idea of what would have been the training at the time of John. Um, and then some other figures I mentioned there too. I'm gonna to leave these others off because they're not as directly of influence on John during this period. Um, and so we can set them aside, although they have important connections, I think, for a full Thomist integration that then kind of integrates the fullness of the Thomist school with the semiotic turn of John's thought. More important for understanding though that the 20th century figures is really this distinction between two approaches to Thomas that really does mark John's thought proximately. So we've been at this long narrative historically, up to this point, we now have reached the proximate distinction that really marks, I think, John among his fellow Thomists, and it's important to bear this in mind. Uh, and what I'm about to say is not meant to stir up any blood if you're from the University of St. Thomas, um, if you disagreed with John on these points. I'm not trying to enter that fray. I sometimes, I think dispositionally, because I, I am of John's mind, I can maybe, you know, on social media have things to say here that's not of the most propriety. Um, but I've tried to even keep that from being too inflammatory. I'm not of mind with the first school, but it's very important. And he was very important. Uh, and his work is inestimable. So I don't want to write it down, namely that of Gilson. Etienne Gilson uh, was the founder, most famously, of uh, PIMS, the Pontifical Institute for Medieval Studies, although he 
was involved in the South, not the South Shore, um, oh my goodness, the Sorbonne uh, in Paris. And he was uh, really, uh, we cannot imagine what Catholic and really more broadly, even just in general, what medieval studies became in the 20th century without taking Chausson uh, into account and uh, registering the, the great um, debt we all owe to his disciples and himself um, for an appreciation of so many themes of the 13th and 14th century. And so Chausson's many works himself, as well as some of his followers whom I've mentioned here, although there are many others, Anton Pegas, Father Joseph Owens, the great Aristotelian scholar, Father Armin Maurer, whose essays should always be uh, considered um, on both matters medieval and also even his own unique pieces. Um, the great histori historian of Thomas Leonard Boyle um, and the many people who work in, uh, diligently at the Center of Thomistic Studies where John worked for many years. Um, in this more Thomasian line, consider the sources of Thomas's thought and yet also its applicability for today, its way to answer the way that Thomas's thought itself can answer the questions um, posed today philosophically and sometimes theologically. I do sometimes find that the Thomism of this period is more philosophical because of the, the immediate context of Leo XIII's uh, epistemological and political designs. But the line of Thomism that was of most influence on, on John's thought was that of Jacques Maritain, um, for whom I have just an infinite affection, uh, without whose thought I would never have become a Thomist myself either. Uh, I could give a separate lecture on him. I, uh, there's a video I did online if you're interested um, that gives some of the details of his thought. Um, you can find it on my professional website. He, in Maritain, although a French layman, he actually was uh, by happenstance reared in the, the Thomist school soon after his conversion. He, uh, he would be you know, very much in line. It's out, he read Thomas like a Dominican would read, and yet he, he strove throughout his career to reinsert Thomism into the warp and woof of the questions of the day, philosophy of art, in the philosophy of knowledge, questions of mysticism that were, were in the vogue in the Catholic and non-Catholic world, politics and so forth, at once trying to be in line, or at least in the context of the great tradition of the Thomist school, and yet also uh, answering questions of today. And although he didn't perhaps see fully the implications of the centrality of semiotics, as John importantly has taught all of us, um, Maritain's spirit is very important in matters both philosophical and even theological, uh, I think, for a vibrant Thomism to this day. And there, in his line, there are people like his protege, uh, Yves Simone, but also the cardinal, later Cardinal, Monsignor then Cardinal uh, Charles Journet, uh, most, most known for his work in ecclesiology, but he, he has a number of works on lengthy work on politics, theological methodology, revelation, and so forth. Austin Woodbury, whom we'll speak of in a bit, in whom we see the Thomas School philosophically articulated with great clarity and profundity. And then some theologians like Michel Labourdet and jean Hervé Nicolas as well. Uh, but that would be a different context where I would talk about them. And then I, I, note, I note some other figures here at the bottom of the, the slide of Miss uh, I have fixed that, I guess. I've, I've miswritten Father Thomas Joseph White's name. But that's kind of other than maybe someone like, you know, Father Benedict, Benedict Ashley and some of the River Forest Thomists, um, they wouldn't be of direct consequence for, for John the same way that the line of Gilson and the line of Maritain were. Very interesting, though, is this figure, Austin Woodbury, who, who was an Australian Marist in Sydney in the, the 20th century. He, was, uh, he went to study at the Angelicum, the Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas Aquinas in the 20s, and then was a rector of a seminary in, in Australia in the 30s to the early 40s. And then he had an institute in Sydney, Australia, the Aquinas Academy, which for a period from what I remember uh, gave out, um, you know, awarded, uh, licentiates in philosophy in combination with the Angelicum. 
he he was a a bit of a um from what I understand he 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 may have been on the autistic spectrum from what I I've heard but I if that's incorrect I I would rescind that um he had that kind of analytic mind though that that one would uh you know attach to a, a certain kind of um uh you know fully functional person on the spectrum who just you know that's their particular mental makeup uh and he was able to structure his a, a genius i mean from all accounts he was an absolute genius uh was able to structurally lay out the line of thomism that comes out of john of saint thomas reflected through the works of francois xavier uh, xavier mccart but then added to by him brilliantly and he structurally lays out in outline format at huge length the various treatises on uh logic natural philosophy at immense length so all the way through all those questions on the soul and all and knowledge and cognition metaphysics um and then ethics and politics and then he does some other things as well but that core of john of saint thomas's thought in particular as well as the metaphysics stuff actually as well he powerfully lays out with a kind of schematic excellence um that it takes just a certain kind of brain to do um and just a certain kind of genius that that i think that only visits the world every so often uh, they are quite brilliant texts and he lectured from them apparently could keep rapt audiences of lay people after work uh, because of the brilliance of his presentation um, at the Aquinas Academy in Sydney. And so Anthony Russell, who was a dear friend of John, left a set of these notes in his collection. And I found them at St. Vincent by accident. And they were sort of set aside. They didn't, I mean, they knew what they were, but they didn't really have them in the collection. And I was over there at a, a different period of my life whenever I had that flexibility. And I, I made copies of the whole things just in case because I had no clue what they were. I thought they were from John's formation, actually. And what they actually were were Anthony's notes from when he was at the, he went down to the Aquinas Academy for, I guess, a couple of years. Um, and Tony was at Loris College with John, passed away um, and left that to, that to John. And John's collection even is marked that it contains these these texts. And I think they are the most clear and profound, even if dry layout of the, the reception of the Thomist school. If you ever wanna understand that side of John's thought quickly and in all of its detail, um, I assure you that even where it seems schematic, it's not. The reasons for these um, positions are are profoundly important. And I, I just have never seen anything as clear as these notes. And although they're based on kind of a clunky literal translation backbone of McCart's work, and um, then you know his own hyper outline format, everything is written in outline format down to six or seven levels worth of outline. I highly recommend looking at these. Um, you know, uh, you can find them at austinwoodbury.com actually. There's one of his students placed them online, but but also too, there's work being done by a very diligent um, receiver of the texts of Woodbury, um, who's been working with uh, Father Woodbury's family, uh, Dr. Andrew Wood, uh, to have them published. So I, I really want to emphasize this as a separate thing, because John himself, at the end of his life, made sure to mark off his collection as having Anthony Russell's, Tony Russell, as he would always call him, uh, texts there. So just, you know, bear that in mind uh, that the late John Dealey would emphasize something quite scholastic like this. Um, just, I want to highly recommend it uh, as a resource. We're drawing to a close, penultimate slide. Uh, within the context really close to John, you have the, of course, the American Dominican context, which is very much at this period still in the 20th century, 20th century, plugged into the Thomist school. You'll find this in the figures from the River Forest Studium, where John had been, well, I'm trying to think if he had been at River Forest or where the Midwest Studium was at that time, it was right before River Forest was built. I think it was River Forest though, right? Um, Benedict Ashley, William Wallace, who actually is uh, Eastern province, I'm pretty sure, but it, Father Wallace's work, not only on the philosophy of science, but moral reasoning and whatnot, 
uh, shows his great erudition of Renaissance Thomism. The uh, integration of the philosophy of the sciences, though, at the Midwest Studium influenced John's thought as well. Some of this also, though, has parallels at what goes on at Laval um, in Canada, uh, which influenced Notre Dame quite a bit through Ralph McInerney. Um, also, there's on the East Coast, uh, Father Walter Farrell, although he died relatively young. But John, I've placed here in the middle of this slide, which comes from a different set of slides, but um, you know, his, his context is probably most closely that of the American OPs, the American Dominicans, especially the River Forest. And we all know, you know, the, uh, the, the importance of semiotic Thomism, which I will take up in a second on the next slide. And then I have here, since I took the slide from a different set, just some other figures of the period to bear in mind. Um, but John is going to interact with them perhaps less. But Robert Sokolowski, somewhat more because he, on occasion, some of the phenomenological stuff was of interest to John because of his work on um, Heidegger early on. But uh, what can we say in conclusion after all this long history? The scholastic scaffolding for John's thought is pivotally important. And I know everybody knows that, but I think it's, it's really important to see that as the kind of backbone that's always to be understood in order to, to really get the 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 central lines of inspiration the central principles operative in john's thought you cannot think along the lines of john Dealey without without really being schooled in the scholastic background um and he was deeply aware of that you know uh founding myth of modernity that scorned scholasticism even though as you'll saw showed so well modernity itself was structured in its questions uh, and in its topics by scholasticism itself that you cannot read Descartes you cannot read Hobbes you cannot read Locke you cannot read um can't even read Hume technically um you cannot read uh I don't know Rousseau even um and others without seeing the scholastic background Kant you can't read Kant without the scholasticism and yet the modern myth so claimed to cut itself off from the historical patrimony that had come before it that to this day uh everything up to truly postmodern thought um especially in the semiotic line that one finds in charles sanders purse uh Sibiak and others uh up to and outside of that modern philosophy and john's thought was so much flyover country and while that's perhaps a little bit strong rhetoric the point he's making is that in the end, the nominalism that is taken without criticism into so much of modern thought uh, really dooms the answers from the beginning that classical modern philosophy can give, truly modern philosophy can give. And so, you know, to really renew and revitalize a truly postmodern and semiotic view of philosophy, one must tap into those proto semiotic moments that do give birth to the, the metaphysical underpinning for the nature of signs that one finds articulated in so great a manner in John of St. Thomas. The meaning of Thomism then for John today, uh, which I think is so important uh, for understanding his thought and at least partially for being part of the, the swath of his progeny, even if not all of us, not all of us who are doing the semiotic stuff have to be pure Thomists. I mean, I'm just more of a Thomist by training and a Thomist by bent. But for John, what it meant to be a Thomist, a kind of semiotic Thomist, was to be part of a tradition of inquiry that was organized around central principles concerning the you know, metaphysical constituents, constitutives of finite being, the nature of relation, the nature of human cognition, the nature of the transcendence of human cognition is in its openness to the divine, uh, the nature of um, or the process of human cognition, the, the way that moral philosophy is to be structured, um, you know, in particular in its, uh, its psychology, as well as the, the way to incorporate Aristotelian um, eudaimonism, and then of course all the theological topics as well, but also open to future developments, sometimes quite profound. Um, in this, he is just like, John is just like Maritain, Journet, Labourdette, and others, uh, 
in that that 20th century, mid 20th century period, Maritans a little bit earlier, but let's just say mid 20th century Thomism that sees it at once as plugged into the school and yet open sometimes profoundly to, um, to future developments. And this will place, and of course it in fact did place John himself uh, thought and John's thought at odds with certain historical Thomists or those who would be more Thomasian in the way that I spoke of earlier. That John's thought uh, in the end is, is concerned with being part of the great debate or the great discussion of Thomist thought through the centuries and renewing it from within. Um, and I think quite profoundly as will be the purpose of the, the more, more uh, speculative talk that I'll give in May. The only way to be truly postmodern and semiotic uh, is to engage with this tradition. John was quite clear about this because of the importance of John of St. Thomas. And this will require a profound recasting, I believe, within Thomism itself. Um, and it's you know something I've taken from John's own recommendations regarding the way that intentional being or objective reality or objective existence must be taken quite seriously if we are to see just the immense domain of mind-dependent reality that is part of reality itself. Um, when we consider, of course, human semiosis, but yes, also the semiosis of lower organisms too, we all of a sudden see the broad swath that is opened in reality uh, because of cognition. But we do this in a way that doesn't separate cognition from nature in the way that so often was the case in the classically modern period, but rather we see the centrality of relation as such, relatio secundum esse, uh, in particular, the relatio secundum esse that is the sign for negotiating, the importance of that for negotiating the boundaries between nature and culture. Uh, and so this will be the topic of my next talk uh, that I'll give in May. Uh, ens intentionale and, and ens ut verum, being as true, looking beyond non-being with Dr. John Dele. Well, I know that's gone very long. Um, I hope that on the whole, this has been uh, useful on some points for all of you. Uh, and I uh, invite you, of course, to reach out to me if you ever want to. Uh, philosophicalcatholic.com is my website, philosophicalcatholic.com. And I look forward to the continued year. And I again, thank all of, all of you who are giving talks. And of course, those involved with the University of Coimbra, but also of course, uh, the other institutions as well for your support of uh, this year's uh, seminar. So all the best to all of you. And I wish you uh, a good 2022.